Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shook Lestan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? I'm doing okay. I know you've been watching some artistic gymnastics at the European Championships. I have been watching artistic gymnastics at the European Championships, and I'm starting to get concerned that just by watching it, I'm going to get hurt. Really? So many of these gymnasts went down in the event finals. It was awful. Like every event final, we lost two girls. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. And not little injuries. Like Asia D'Amato couldn't come out for her silver medal that she won because she was so badly injured in the vault final. So, yeah, be careful watching it that you're not manifesting a blown ACL. Well, I hope she's better. I only watched the very beginning of the European Championships. It is it is so hard not to get sucked into the multi-sport verse once you start. Yes, and apparently it's also hard not to get hurt. Well, today, hopefully we won't be getting hurt because we're watching a movie, not, not, not a competition. Don't choke on popcorn. <laughs> it is time for Movie Club. Film Buffran is back, and we are talking about the official film of the 1992 Albertville Winter Olympics. It's called One Light, One World, which is directed by Joe J. Gelbert and R. Douglas Copsey. Take a listen. Fran, welcome back. We are discussing One Light, One World, the official film from the Albertville 1992 Olympics. What do you got for us? Why did you make me watch this movie? (laughs) (laughs) I wanted so many times to text you guys. (laughs) I think this was my idea. I take all responsibility. Blame for this. I'm sorry. It did have Jean-Claude Keeley, though. But I don't think we've done an official film yet. We did not do an official film. So, yeah, it actually it was actually interesting to see how the people behind the film actually put together their take on the Olympics. I thought the opening fire montage, the flame montage was a little long (laughs) and drawn out. But it was like a slow burn. It felt like it was kind of awkward at first. And then it kind of fell into a nice rhythm where they went through multiple disciplines and showcased a lot of the events at the 92 games and and showcased some of the stars of the events. So it really was more factual than probably most of the movies we've watched lately. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> there was no Bollywood <laughs> dances, no spontaneous Bollywood. This could have um, really used a Bollywood number. <laughs> it could have used one, definitely. I, I have to admit, I kind of nodded off <laughs> at about the hour 10 mark, <laughs> but wow. it was hard. It was rough. When we read the Rome 1960 book, I then went and watched the Rome 1960 movie. And there was a through line in that movie having to do with ancient Rome. And they kept coming back to that theme. This, even though they called it One World, One Light, and they started off with this flame theme, they never seemed to come back to it. It, it, There was no through line with this. It just felt like their through line was, now we're going to talk to Jean-Claude Keeley again and show this weird little face drawing. Correct. And that's supposed to be the touchstone. There was no touchstone to hang on to, so it was like watching just a series of vignettes, which for an Olympic, you know, and a film about a particular Olympics, you've got to work really hard for it not to be a series of vignettes. Mm. 
And there was a lot about this movie that they did not work hard on. What was really interesting, I thought, I thought the most surprising thing to me watching the more recent Winter Games is how much of this Olympics was set completely outdoors. Because not only was the opening and closing ceremonies completely outside, all of the speed Speed skating. skating events were all outside. It was just really interesting to see. And the conditions looked pretty extreme in some instances, um, especially on one of the downhill races that they were commenting on. I mean, it looked more intense and the field had to deal with more of the, the weather issues than you saw in more recent games. Yeah, it was the women's downhill and mm-hmm. the women's moguls that they showed both mm-hmm. had snow and, and the moguls had the wind. And when I was looking at the outdoor events, like you mentioned, it made me a little sad because I kind of felt like none of that was man-made snow. It was all natural snow. And it Mm -hmm. made me wonder, we're only 30 years on. And yet how many more Olympics are we going to see with natural snow just because of climate change? Mm. True. It's a good point. I mean, when you think about the last Olympics in Beijing and how, what, was there anything but artificial snow anywhere? I mean, and just to see what they had to go through to get these games going. And I mean, I'm sure it was just as difficult with all the weather conditions back then, just being able to have the courses habitable to the athletes. I mean, it was really cool, actually, that one segment where they were showing them digging out, I believe, the luge track. That was really kind of cool, I thought, showing that kind of behind the scenes action. And they didn't really do much of that. It was, like you said, more of just a lot of vignettes about certain athletes. And it wasn't even it was a really wide smattering. I mean, there was a couple of Americans and then they brought brought in, I believe, some French, obviously some French athletes that were excellent and a Canadian. And so they tried to make it, I guess that was that that whole one world thing where they tried to kind of bring in, you know, a lot of different athletes from different places. But knowing that it was such a long time ago, I almost kind of wished they did like a 2.0 version with those athletes now as they reminisce and look back on those moments rather than when they talk to them immediately after the games. Right, because the films are made very quickly afterwards. And it was Mm -hmm. strange to hear them, like you said, reminisce about something that had just happened. And some of those interviews were so stilted. You know, I wonder if their answers not were scripted in that they were told what to say, but they Mm -hmm. rehearsed them all so that when they actually Mm -hmm. recorded the interviews, there was nothing spontaneous. There was nothing off the cuff. It just felt like Paul Wiley and Donna Weinbreck and Bonnie Blair even Mm -hmm. just sounded like they were reading from a page, which is not how they sounded in interviews in real life, in real life at the time. I mean, uh, especially Bonnie Blair has a lot of charm to her. And that did not, I mean, they managed to make Alberto Tomba boring in this movie. (laughs) You know, what wasn't boring, the outfits. (gasps) <gasps> I loved the outfits. And Can the I mustaches. Just tell you, and the mustache. I, I loved all of the unbelievable bright ski outfits. It was great. It was pure early 90s joy watching them in those outfits. <laughs> lots of mustaches, lots of mullets, <laughs> lots of, of very large perms. Back in yes, Tony good hair. Bang, standing straight up. It took us right back to college, right? It oh, was... definitely. Oh, Christy Yamaguchi's hair in the, in her last skating event. I mean, how it did not move. There was so much Aquanet in her hair. It was amazing. High <laughs> <laughs> <By> gravity. <laughs> did you catch in the opening montage? There was a very quick glimpse of Tanya Harding. Oh, was yes. there? Oh, I yes. missed her. I didn't notice that. I thought it was interesting. But I do want to say, like, it was weird that this was kind of like a travelogue movie almost or 
a daily diary because they kind of went day by day. This was directed by Joe J. Jalbert, and this was not his first rodeo with Olympic films either. He's done other ones. One of the things he did do was pioneer or implement point of view cameras. And I got to say, I really liked that on the downhill skiing and in the luge, but it, there wasn't enough. Like, I mm-hmm. really felt how fast the downhill skiers go when they're doing those courses. And it makes you think, oh, my gosh, how fast they have to be able to react and see the course. It's just unbelievable what they can do. But, yeah, the the whole beginning with this very long torch relay, which was very odd because they handed the torch off. There was no, not everybody got their own torch. They just kind of passed it off to each other. You got a little glimpse of the Concorde. Did you notice that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like, the oh, defunct. wow. Where have yeah. you been? Oh. But yeah, it, it was interesting. The sports they chose, the stories they chose to tell. And it also seemed like it had an awfully American bent. Mm-hmm. Like Not we... right away, but then it all of a sudden became the American show, I felt like. Right, right. In a way that was, oh, well, Bonnie Blair, you expected because she did well. Mm-hmm. Donna Weinbrecht did well. But in the women's downhill where they talked with both the Canadian skier and the U.S. skier, mm-hmm. that didn't really pan out. Uh, hockey barely got a mention because right, the U.S. Right. was out. Right. Um, sports that we didn't do well. Like, you never saw anything about biathlon. You never saw anything about... How about curling? Nordic- no curling and it was a a demonstration sport you never saw anything about speed skiing but maybe that's because somebody died and you didn't see anything about nordic combined either it was just kind of like oh we're gonna ignore some of these sports and and or men's figure skating right that was surprising that they did a lot of figure skating but not the men's yeah they had a little segment where they talked to paul wiley for Mm -hmm. a minute that he praised and that was it. When we, we talked about men's figure skating, this was the competition of who stayed standing one. Mm. And I got to say, I know you said you had a million stories about figure skating, Allison. <laughs> Does one of those stories include the costumes that Lloyd Eisler and Isabel Brasseur wore? Because those were jaw-dropping. I did not remember those costumes. I remember their <laughs> costumes from 94. I did not remember them from 92 because all I could remember was Klimova's long red permed hair. Mm-hmm. Klimova and Ponomarenko. And I did not remember that she wore it down for the finals because she always had all this hair everywhere, but usually it was up in a ponytail, up in a butt. But when they showed that, I'm like, and she had the wings. She had those gray uh-huh. wings and I was like oh man I had totally forgotten where costumes were at that stage and it was and how did she perform with that hair down like that's impressive too I mean with all the spins and the leaps and the I mean that's incredible I know I, it was long and it was everywhere uh-huh. and you know what I also noticed too on the skiing who didn't wear helmets a lot of the women at that point still were not wearing helmets my mind was like boggled by that. There was still some knit caps coming down the hill. Yep. Wow. Or no caps. Nothing. Just your mullet blowing in the breeze. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think it was because they had so much hairspray and mousse. <laughs> it wasn't going it, anywhere. <laughs> that protected you like a helmet. Things bounced but off how your about hair. But how about the people that they showed on the ski courses? There were so many spectators or judges or officials on the courses. It was starting to make me nervous because, I mean, there were so many people all over that course. I'm like, at any moment, any of those skiers could have gotten out of control. I mean, and you don't see that now at all. Gave you flashbacks of other side of the mountain. It did. It totally did. I had forgotten about Georg Hockel. And again, how did they manage to make him boring? (laughs) He was handsome and charming and brilliant. And yet, oh, and how dominant he was in Luge was nice to be reminded of. Well, one thing I think they did really well was the scenery. It really made you want to go 
to those ski areas. I mean, even the chalets and the scenes of the mountains and just everything just looked so beautiful. I mean, it was like your quintessential alpine, you know, setting. You know, when you think of a Winter Olympics, you think, oh, this is like the perfect setting to host this contest. Yeah, it really was beautiful. And what I really wanted to see more of, and I'm going to have to go back and and watch the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies, which just looked so very French mm. with the the dancing and the acrobats and the very Cirque-like elements to it, that we got some of that flair in the opening ceremony montage, which showed Team USA walking in. And then we hardly got it was like oh we ran out of time for the closing (laughs) (laughs) we gotta go (laughs) it was it was very Cirque du Soleil yep that's what I thought myself the other thing I noticed from the opening ceremony was all the wool trench coats all the teams had these wool trench coats that was the theme and fedoras it was probably freezing (laughs) (laughs) you know they were not doing the high-tech insulated wear it was you got a long wool coat you got a fedora good luck (laughs) well and then all of the uniforms but besides the ceremonies outfits the uniforms you forget what a color puke explosion that they were (laughs) just like how many teal pink green yellow can we throw up on one ski suit or did you notice in the little bit that they did on cross country the finnish cross country uniforms which were like harlequin i guess you would say Mm. where the front of one leg would be green and the front of the other leg might be blue and then the back of the one leg would be red and the other leg would be yellow so it would be like the olympic colors and i don't know if there was a black section of the the suit at all but it was like oh wow you are really going with this olympic rings theme here i had forgotten how much teal there was in 1992 (laughs) teal was just everywhere everywhere it was. It is a lost color. I'm glad it's a lost color. But it, is, it is a lost color that is just begging to come back. Oh, and then can you bring back all of like the parachutey type, yes, the drapey clothes? Oh my goodness, the so warm up suits. Yes, the, war- oh, the warm goodness. up, the, the those Reebok style, like, ah, uh, it was great. <laughs> It definitely brings you back to college. (laughs) We're totally dating ourselves. Speaking of dating ourselves, appearance of Herschel Walker. Oh, I know. (laughs) I had completely forgotten. So Herschel Walker was a football player, but ended up pushing for bobsled, like so many bobsledders do. They switch sports. And I had completely forgotten that he had been on that team and they interview him and unfortunately did not catch him at a good moment. That was, he did not come off well in that interview. Uh, and and you, did you know that he is now running for Senator in the state of Georgia? Well, his opponent can just drag up this footage. <laughs> <laughs> that and an attack ad, I guess. It, yeah, it was not, did not One of the Really One of the sure. little vignettes that I really liked was Kathy Turner, the, the short track speed skater, because i not really remembering her. I mean, I, of course, I remember Tomba and of course, I remember Yamaguchi and and Kerrigan and all these other amazing athletes, Bonnie Blair. But her name I didn't recall. And when they told her story about how she had given up short track and then decided to get back into it and just against all odds became the gold medalist. That was really inspiring to me. I had forgotten that short track was in 92. I don't remember short track until we get to Apollo Ono. That's, I think they said that's it was in my uh, brain where short track starts, which is not accurate, right? I think they said in 88 it was a demonstration sport so i think this was the first actual year of medals it just yeah. it's one of those things that didn't stick and and speaking of new sports or demonstrate and demonstration sports both with moguls being a new sport, correct when tom kelly was on he talked about 
just the level of difficulty and how different it was. And I don't want to say it was easy because it was tough then, but you could tell, oh my goodness, just how the moguls were smaller, the jumps were a lot easier because everything was so new in the sport. And it's mm-hmm. amazing how far athletes have come and how far mm-hmm. they've pushed the envelope just in 30 years. But it seemed to me, too, that the skiers, the footage of the skiing, I thought was actually kind of exciting. And it seemed more fresh and alive. Like, I don't feel like I felt that way watching Beijing. And I don't know if it was just because of the footage or the fact that I knew that they weren't on real snow or what it was. It just felt really exciting to watch even those those little clips that they gave at the end of this movie. And it could be just the way they shot this because Correct. Gelbert was had a background in skiing, so he mm. probably had a better feel of how to shoot that, maybe more mm-hmm. so than some other sports. I think it also could have been the French crowd came through in the footage that they included in the movie. Mm-hmm. They showed all that footage of the giant crowds, and you could hear them mm-hmm. in the background, the flags and the bells, and all of that was included in the footage. And you saw how many people attended. I mean, it was thousands. I mean, it was really well attended just looking at that footage. Yeah, what we're used to nowadays, it's just so different. <laughs> <laughs> and what I also like to see, in the, and I don't think they gave her enough credit, was uh, Surya Bonnelly. No, at the end. no, we did not hear much. I, it was also like, oh, we've covered two figures. Like, we're going to talk a lot about figure skating because it's an important sport in the olympic program but we gave so much time to some of the other disciplines that we didn't have time for to say much about women Mm -hmm. so yeah we didn't see a whole lot of surya bonally which would have been fantastic because she was a hometown favorite even though she didn't do well in the finals also in figure skating a very happy looking nancy kerrigan (laughs) <laughs> a very right a very much different i mean obviously when you get whacked in the knee you're not gonna it's not gonna be pleasant you're you've got all this media scrutiny but this film showed a really different side to her very yeah she was different. very yeah she was very warm and engaging and yeah i i thought she had a lot of poise the one outfit that did stand out was hers on the ice because it was just so elegant and regal And it was interesting to see, you know, that they pointed out that back then that she didn't have the technical skill that Yamaguchi had or Midori Ito had, but she was still up there in the top three. Vera Wang special. Yes, (laughs) that's right. That's right. I mean, what a difference. And, And that is timeless. I mean, you could have worn that at this Olympics and it would have looked appropriate. I don't know. You put that hair. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the hair. Yamaguchi's was a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, and what's, what's funny about Yamaguchi's dress is that is not the same dress that she wore at the U.S. Nationals. She had a new dress made for the Olympics, so this one was fancier. Ah. Well, it was certainly sparkly. Also, <laughs> a huge fixture at the skating rink, the fur coats on oh, everybody. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, what a bygone era that is. It's like there's Tamara Moskvina, who is still coaching <laughs> Don's fur coat. But there, she, it's bigger than she is. Well, I think Bonnie Blair's mom had one on, too. Yes. She was rocking one. <laughs> it was interesting to see the talks with the families and the focus on watching them in the crowd and Bonnie Blair's mother was just hilarious to, <laughs> to watch. she was not putting up with any of this cheering before she won no there are so many skaters still to come <laughs> she was just such the midwestern mom going no we will not celebrate <laughs> until it's official <laughs> One interesting thing that Bonnie Blair said in her interview was something that still happens today, which we heard with Aaron Jackson, our speed skater. We only care about speed skating once every four years. Yeah, that was a shame. I I caught that. That was a big dig. (laughs) And unfortunately, still true. And yet Bonnie Blair was 
one of the biggest stars that came out of that game. So, I mean, she was on the cereal boxes. She was mm-hmm. everywhere. She was on the Campbell soup commercials. She must have been the role model for girls like Erin Jackson and all the people that have come up since Bonnie Blair, just seeing what she could do. I mean, she was a master technician. I mean, looking just looking at the footage, I mean, they kept saying she was so perf- perfection on ice, but you could really see it when she was skating no wonder she blew everybody else away just because you could you could see it in what she what she was and how strong she was and you mentioned this before i miss it being outside yeah but as i mentioned earlier about climate change you really can't do that anymore it's very hard to control that temperature and environment and settings you really need the ovals now indoors mm-hmm. to to manage that One very important detail we have not mentioned, our narrator. In a world. (laughs) When I saw Don Lafontaine, wait, when I saw Don Lafontaine's name popped up, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. It was just, oh, that was was a whole other element. It was over, completely over the top. It was unbelievable. I did not enjoy that. No, I didn't either. Because it was too much. Right. It made everything sound. And part of it is because that has become such a trope that in a world Mm -hmm. where where everything is about to explode. And and (laughs) he became a parody of himself as time went on. Exactly. And he did not know that's how he made his career was doing those over the top movie previews. And then he started making fun of that style because that was no mm-hmm. longer the style but on this because of what happened subsequently it just sounded like he was making fun of everybody all the time mm-hmm. because it doesn't require that seriousness but yeah the the whole over the top announcing was just the icing on the bad cake <laughs> <laughs> this, and i wonder if it's a 90s thing and we will have to go back now and watch mm. some of the other like 88 summer 92, 94, 96, because this felt so of its time in a bad way. Mm. Like some of the earlier films that I've watched felt of their time, but in a lovely nostalgic way. And maybe it's just because of the age I was in in 92, that this just felt like a parody of 92. Like Mm. I, I wanted it to capture more of the timeless quality of the Winter Olympics and less of the ridiculousness of the time. Mm. But maybe 92 was just too ridiculous <laughs> to be contained. For words. <laughs> well, you know, when you put a headband on people, there were a lot of headbands. Can I say? Because I, I went back to my the top of my notes and I'm back to those uniforms that they had for the <laughs> torch relay, which were pure white pants and the puffy jacket and puffy athletic jacket, not a puffy coat, and a headband. And they had this little tiny torch that they passed back and forth that was very thick, so it looked like it was hard to hold. And honest to Pete, when I saw those people in their white uniforms, I'm like, wow, that is not much different from all of the Tyvek people we saw in Beijing. <laughs> all, all has matted up. <laughs> it's just different. <laughs> Maybe they could have used some headbands. <laughs> and and it, it had that very 90s double zipper at the collar. <laughs> like, oh, this is unfortunate. I'm still waiting for Tomba to become a Hollywood star. <laughs> they said yeah, he, and- want, he was going to Hollywood. What happened? Well, you know, we've got our Alberville moments. We have many months of those still to come. So no doubt Tomba will be <laughs> front and center of the week. I mean, it did kind of give us a, a true sense of how accomplished he was because I didn't realize he was so young and so accomplished at these games. I mean, he always seemed larger than life. And it was really kind of funny, interesting how Jean-Claude Keeley said, this guy shouldn't be the number one. He's too big. He's too muscular. You know, he's just too much, but he's just pure muscle and skill. <laughs> And he does incredibly well. And the other thing that Keeley said that I thought was really insightful, he said he's a lot smarter than people think he is. Yes. That Tomba had this persona that belied what a fierce competitor he was and Mm -hmm. how serious he took 
winning that medal and how much that meant to him. And he was always party boy shaking the champagne, but he got on that course and nobody was better than him. Yep. He just went to work. You know what I just thought of? Maybe the through line was the one light that they kept showing the cauldrons at all of the different venues. Mm. And maybe that's what's supposed to be the through line because it just it made me go, wow, those are really funky cauldrons. Mm. But wasn't it nice to have a cauldron? <laughs> It was nice to have a cauldron, and and but they also look like the massive bouquets that the medalists got. I saw that. Yes, I was like those are bigger than they are. I mean, <laughs> they were they were not concerned about the environmental impact of cutting flowers and wrapping them in plastic. And then the double kisses. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're touching each other. Right, right. And then, and then in in the figure skating, the women's figure skating, the podium for the gold medalist was so high that Juan Antonio Samaranch <laughs> almost couldn't give Christy Hamaguchi her medal. <laughs> it's like Juan Antonio Samaranch was not a particularly short man, but between the skates and the height, it was like. How, how do we lean over this far without toppling? And she had that hair. So when she leaned <laughs> forward, those bangs could have taken her over. Now, question. Did they mention that in Midori Ito's performance, she had a quad? She Is that quad. true? She had, she had the triple axel. I thought they mentioned a quad. And I said, they, there's no way. They did mention a quad because I did note that as well. Okay. I was really shocked, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, they were actually trying to do quads back in the early 90s? I'm like, well, that's Kurt, pretty incredible. Kurt Browning had landed the first quad prior and to And when that. was that? Eight, oh, now you're going to make me sound stupid. I think it was 89 <laughs> or 90. Oh, okay. He had landed the first quad in competition. Okay, so it was something on the minds of all the more technical jumping skaters then. Right. But, but I was really then, surprised to hear that, that that was part of her plan. Right. She was attempting it. She didn't land it, though. Right, right. Right, right. Okay. That makes me, I'm like, wait a second. I missed that, too. I totally, I was so <laughs> dazzled by all that sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very curious, and obviously none of us can answer this question, how this movie plays to people who do not remember Alberville. Mm. Does it just look like this very bizarre time capsule or does it capture? I mean, Albert Bill was fun. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of fun athletes. There was a lot of fun events. It was beautiful, like we were saying. And I'm not sure this movie captured it that well, but we will all fill in the blanks with our own memories. Correct. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from people who don't remember it and how this movie plays to them. It's interesting. In the end, when you were saying about how you were looking at older Olympic movies, I went way back and did some from the 20s. And like you were saying, I, I think you nailed it before. They they had this kind of ethereal nostalgia for those games. And obviously, these were not even talkies. So it had that quality to it. But there was just kind of a more interesting kind of feel to it than this one had. This one, I felt it just kind of plotted along. And, you know, I was like, okay, it's an hour and 43 minutes. Okay. I can get to the finish line. Like I could watch it all. And it just felt, it felt hard to watch, even though they had, like you said, they had so many interesting characters, but the movie itself, I feel like didn't portray everything in the best light. It makes me want to go back and watch maybe Sarajevo, 1984 because that would be one where I personally don't have a memory of anything except for I know of Torval and Dean now and Scott Hamilton but I don't know much else about the competitions so it would be interesting to go back because that's certainly close enough in time where you'd still have this wacky style I could have a touch point with the fashion but would be interesting to see if that told me a story or if I really got the feel for what those games were like by just watching that. Well, 84 had Katarina Witt. Mm, that too. <laughs> the queen of the ice. And her feathered fishy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we tried it. I think the Olympic films are going to be hit and miss to be quite honest, but it was a fun experiment and it certainly gave me more of a feel of for Albertville. Mm. Just a, just as a location. 
and it makes me totally want to stay in the Calgary Hotel. Oh, (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) And you know what? It was very nice because you did see the 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 patriotism and the feeling of respect and awe and just with Jean-Claude Keeley and the other French representatives who put on the games, you could tell, like they treated it very seriously, wanted everybody to have a wonderful experience. And you got the sense that they really put their all into the games, just not this movie. (laughs) Okay. Last thing, you know, what really made me mad. The use of the marker font on the title. (laughs) (laughs) The Paris figure skating gold medalist is Mishka Tunic and Dmitriev. Oh. And do they mutilate their names? Oh. (laughs) Repeatedly said her name with vowels that don't even exist. (laughs) Shame on them. Don LaFontaine let me down. In a world <laughs> where, where I the can't announcers say Russian can't names. pronounce the Russian unified team names. <laughs> well, okay, I know that was the last thing for you, but I do have to say, we slipped to Russia a lot because this was the first games with the unified team. They had been put together fairly quickly, but it wasn't all Russia, and they kept saying Russia, Russia all over again. It was so interesting. But you're still in that kind of Cold War mentality where for us, the Soviets and the Russians were interchangeable. Uh-huh. And you, I really got that feeling. So, well, we tried it, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> it was a worthwhile thing. effort. Yep. You let me, you make me watch this and you don't let us watch the cutting edge. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'll wear you guys down. I'll wear Allison down. Someday. (laughs) Someday. (laughs) All right. What is our next film? So our next movie club movie is Race, which will be the story of Jesse Owens. So we will be going way back in time before any of us were an inkling. So this should be interesting because, like you said before, Jill, we don't have any preconceived notions for what we're about to watch. And I was really looking forward. I, I miss seeing this when it came out. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this and see how they portray both him and the Olympics in this film. Excellent. Well, Fran, thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran. You can watch One Light, One World in its entirety on the official Olympics website at olympics.com. And we will have a link to that in the show notes. I will say I am very glad that the IOC has put up all of the official films to watch for free. That's really interesting. I can't believe we made it through this film. (laughs) Well, you know. Uh, That sound means it's time for our history segment. So we are staying in Albertville, which is the Olympics that we're looking at all year long. It is the 30th anniversary of those games. Allison, you have women's figure skating part two for us. I do. So last week we talked about Tanya and Nancy, and now we're actually going to talk about the other people on the podium, which is Midori Ito and Christy Yamaguchi, who won the gold and silver, respectively. So 1992 was the first Olympics after compulsory figures were eliminated from figure skating. So this sort of shook up the whole top tier of figure skating. Jill Trenery from the United States won the 1990 World Championships, and she was kind of a compulsory specialist. So... Yeah, 91 was not a good year for her at the World Championships. And then by 92, she had a severe ankle injury. And that did her in. So we never heard from Jill Trenery again. Shame, because I did love her as a skater. And I was very sorry she couldn't make it on the Olympic stage. Absolutely. So now it looks like the competition is going to be between 1989 world champion Midori Ito, who was the first world champion skater from Japan. And we have since seen Japanese skaters really come to the fore. And Christy Yamaguchi, who is from the United States. Ito was the first woman to land a triple axel in competition. And the Japanese press leading up to Alberville was really, really hard on her. So she had an incredible amount of pressure going in. 
she ended up taking the axle out of the short program because she was having so much trouble on it, but fell on the jump that she replaced it with, which was a triple Lutz. So she ended up in fourth after the short program and Christy had a perfect short program and she, she was first. So in the long program, Christy stated first of the final group to Carmen, one of our favorite music choices for figure skating. And she fell as well on a triple loop, but otherwise she was brilliant. So Ito comes on, decides that she's going to do the triple axel, falls. But she tried it again in the second half of her program and landed it. So she became the first woman to land the triple axel in the Olympics. And her long program was so good that she pulled herself up to the silver medal. So that was a very exciting ending to a lot of falling in the women's competition. And it would be almost 20 years until another woman landed a triple axel at the Olympics. And interestingly enough, another Japanese skater, Mawasada, in 2010. Oh, very nice. So I do want to mention this last little bit about Jill Trenery, because I mentioned this back when we talked about ice dance, where we mentioned Isabel Duchesnay was the first wife of Christopher Dean. Jill Trenery was the second wife. Are they still married? No. Oh. <laughs> they did have two sons and they were married for a long time. I believe they separated like in the early 20 teens. He's married again. To another skater? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think he finally learned his lesson. Welcome to Shook Flaston. Yes, it's time to check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show, which now make up our citizens of our country, Shook Flaston. First up, some sad news. Connor Fields has retired from BMX racing. Not a surprise. No, and it, it just it's really sad, I think, to have a forced retirement. But he was he posted a YouTube video, which we'll link to in the show notes, and he's just so grateful for everything the sport's given it given him and it just got me right in the feels right in the fields no <laughs> <laughs> shot putter michelle carter has collaborated with jewelry company mabel and maine to co-design and develop a new collection which is out and incredibly beautiful i would agree i was gonna say good for her Bob Sledder Lauren Gibbs has joined Grow Class as a mentor, and Grow Class is a company that offers online marketing classes and mentorship. And the figure skating schedule is out, and pair skater Nate Bartolome and partner Katie McBeath are, stated, are slated to compete at two Grand Prix events this season, Skate Canada International on October 28th to 30th, and then the MK John Wilson Trophy in Great Britain, which will be November 11th to the 13th. Kelly Chang and Betsy Flint won gold at the Volleyball World Beach Pro Tour in Hamburg, beating Switzerland's Brunner and Hurbeli 2-0. David Marinus's book, Path Lit by Lightning, The Life of Jim Thorpe, was featured on the cover of the New York Times Book Review. We've got two Shook Flastanis in the running for the World Anti-Doping Agency's Athletes Council, they are Tom Scott and Claire Egan. They are two of 34 candidates vying for eight seats representing international federations on the council. So the election will be held virtually at the end of August and results will be announced in early September. So thank you to listener Meredith for that tip. And speed skater Aaron Jackson and snowboarder Chloe Kim have been selected as finalists for the 2022 Women's Sports Foundation Sportswoman of the Year Award in the individual category. And we will have a link to the voting place for that. It's sportswomanoftheyear.com. And the deadline is August 22nd. Uh, we have some news from Paris 2024. Thank you, listener David, for this tip. There is a new footbridge that links the Stade de France and the site of the Olympics Aquatic Center during the Paris 2024 Olympics. For Inside the Games, this bridge will span the A1 motorway 
And that will help cut down the amount of time it takes to get from one side of the highway to the other, which is currently 20 to 25 minutes. So a nice little bit of legacy there. This made me think of us trying to get from the curling venue to the hockey venue back in Beijing. Like there was a a pathway that we could have walked across, but we weren't allowed to. So I will be very joyous if they actually let us walk across this motorway. (laughs) Paris 2024 head Tony Estangue has visited Tahiti to check out the surfing location. Shocking. There are issues. Right. So per Radio 1 in Tahiti and Inside the Games, Estangue is touched by the land's commitment to the projects, which is the most decentralized game site in Olympic history. And I do kind of wonder if this will ever happen again. It will either be a beautiful competition and be so far removed that it doesn't feel Olympic unless you're on TV and you don't notice, or it will not go well because it's so far away. So now as <laughs> Estangue has said, he's hoping that more local organizations get involved with the effort because, hey, guess what? There's a lack of progress on the whole project. <laughs> and according to that article in Inside the Games, there's some local opposition to the building. Right. So they need to refurbish a hotel and they're going to use that as an athlete's village. There's some refurbishment work to do at the Teopu Marina, and they're going to build a parking lot, and then they've got temporary facilities to use for competition sites. And they have a, about a month and a half to get the work program for that done, which needs to happen by October in order to be on time for the whole project. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, LA 2028's shortlisted their new sports. So as you remember, a whole bunch of sports keep vying to get on the Olympic program. Now nine have been asked to make a final presentation or final application. That would include cricket, which is going to be a T20 format. And I'm not really up on cricket. But this is, if you are, it's the T20 format is 20 overs, and each side has just 80 minutes to get through their 20 overs, and there's a 15-minute break between innings. So this is a much condensed version of the game, obviously, to be quick that that they're looking for in the Olympics. Also shortlisted, break-in, baseball, softball, which I know you're hoping. I don't even care about baseball. I want softball in. I actually don't want baseball in. And it makes me angry that they're shackled to each other. Mm. Flag football, lacrosse, karate, kickboxing, squash, and motorsport. Now, you may wonder why motorsport is on this list. Because the Olympic Charter did say at one time that sports disciplines or events in which performance depends essentially on mechanical propulsion are not acceptable. But that little phrase has been taken out of the charter, leading to the inclusion of motorsports and also water sports, because the the Motorsports Association was recognized by the IOC in 2012. So now they are on inclusion list. Electric karting, also known as e-karting, was an exhibition event at the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires in 2018. So that could be what the motorsport is for 2028. You are not thrilled by this. Well, one of the criteria that they are considering is environmental sustainability. How can you have motorsports and consider that environmentally sustainable? Well, it's an electric cart. You still have to power it with something. The electricity has to come from somewhere. Is it coming from wind? Is it coming from solar? Right. I I think my initial beef with electric karting is that it's the low end of motorsports. And you don't see professional motorsport drivers necessarily. I don't know all of the motorsport circuit, but you are not going to get the best of the best in motorsports. You are going to get the junior levels, which... Is like having another football tournament in the Olympics because that is also a junior level thing on the men's side. So maybe on the women's side, it'd be a little bit better because there aren't as many women in the top tiers of driving as there are men. But I just, I'm not convinced yet. No, 
on electric car. Electric I, car there's car. no way you're going to convince me on motorsports. <laughs> when you think about how expensive and how unenvironmentally friendly, you know, moving horses are for equestrian, we're mm-hmm. talking about moving people's carts or cars or boats. Never mind the actual expense and environmental expense of electrifying things. It that's what you're going to add. Don't know because they also have to meet this athlete quota that's ten thousand five hundred athletes. Now we don't know if boxing or weightlifting or modern pentathlon will be in LA twenty twenty eight. That's yet to be determined. Like you said, they've got these criteria they have to include on their proposal, such as environmental stability. They have to uphold integrity and fairness and recognize the interest in the host country and also offer global appeal. I also don't think e-carding has local or global appeal, unless you're in the sport. But the kids like it. Yeah, I know. I say, yeah, I know you can say you can say that about breaking too. I'm very curious to see what would get in because... I mean, you are talking about several team sports here, and that's always been an issue with dealing with the quota, but you've also got a bunch of individual sports, so we'll see what what makes it. What what did not make this cut, Sambo, Flying Disc, which is pushing hard to get in, and Tech Ball, which I don't really see Tech Ball getting into the Olympics anytime soon. The International Paralympic Committee has announced that for the Paralympics in 2028, 33 sports have applied to be in the Games. Now, apparently, they don't have a set program like the IOC does. So the 33 sports that have applied include the 22 sports that are on the Paris 2024 program, and then there are 11 additional sports. These include arm wrestling, sport climbing, golf, karate, cerebral palsy football, also known as CP football, power chair football, dance sport, sailing, surfing, wheelchair handball, and beach para volley, which would be volleyball on the beach. So Inside the Games noted that sailing and CP football have been on the program before. They competed at last at Rio 2016, and visually impaired wrestling was on the program in the 1980s, so it's trying to get back in. It actually makes sense in some ways that the sports have to reapply because other than, say, para-athletics and para-swimming, the participation probably swings mm, interesting. a great deal. And then when you have updates, say, for prosthetics, that might eliminate an entire sport. If you have a change in therapy or a change in prosthetics, just like they're redoing the classifications, medical advances probably could eliminate some categories. Interesting. So we shall see. This is, it's also interesting development to see what wants to get into the Paralympics and, or get back into the Paralympics as well. Um, We've got a little bit of Brisbane 2032 news. We've got to get a sounder for Brisbane 22. I know we're, we're not ready for this. (laughs) Our friend Rich Perlman over at the sports examiner mentioned that there are some shocking arguments about budgets and construction. So one of the big deals is that the Queensland government wants to demolish and rebuild the the GABA, which is what they call the Brisbane Cricket Ground, and that's the main stadium. Now, if you remember, because this will be always a sticking point in my mind, when the Future Host Commission did their reports, they said, you do not need to build a new stadium. This one is fine. And the government said, oh, no, 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 no. We need a new stadium. (sighs) So, of course, the Brisbane Times has has been reporting, look, we got some issues with the project proposals. It could cost major budget overruns to the tune of one billion Australian dollars. Queensland government still committed to the project. And there's no infrastructure schedule in place, which would include planned delivery timelines and cost. That was something that was promised last year. And people are going, well, we still have 10 years. No big deal. I wonder if there is any provision to take away an Olympics from a city. I don't know because that's... It happened in the winter 76 when Denver was going to host and then... Well, they they turned it down. So I don't know if that's the same exact situation, but 
we've never really had a games taken away. I don't think this would be enough to take the games away. They just would be, in, it, it'd be 10 years of bad press. Right. And if it gets to a point where there's corruption and there's budget overruns and that host city committee feels like they've been lied to, how do they address that? Because we've, we've awarded a games so far ahead of time. What happens when things go wrong? I don't know because Rio happened. Right. But that was a different, a different era, of course. But I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they've ever really thought about, would we ever take a games away? Do we have a premarital contract that allows for divorce? I don't know. But yeah, I don't know what would push the IOC to say you cannot help host these games. Haven't there been other games that have been taken away or moved? Not Olympic games or Paralympic games, but other... Oh, sure. World Championships and... Right, because they weren't ready. Either they weren't ready or, in the case of most recently, things that were scheduled to be in Russia have all been moved. Right. And a lot of stuff in China got moved because of COVID. A lot of stuff got moved around because of COVID regardless, but not necessarily an outside event happening to a committee, an organizing committee. It's the organizing committee imploding in such a way that an event got moved. I don't know. If you if you know of something, listeners, let us know. All right. We would like to give a big shout out to our Patreon patrons who keep our flame alive. You can find out more about patronage at patreon.com slash flame alive pod. And one of the bonuses you get as a Patreon patron is some extra material that Jill and I make. And this month, you find out how Jill risked my life again <laughs> and almost got us sent to Chinese prison <laughs> once again. So just go check out patreon.com and flame, uh, slash flame alive pod and you can see what a criminal she is. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a criminal. Also, our patrons got a little extra input. We're going to have a special event in the spring, and they have been asked to help us decide when it should happen. So if you'd like to be in on that kind of contributions to the show, check out patreon.com slash flamelivepod. Oh, that will do it for this week. Let us know your thoughts about Albertville 1992, and it's a wonderful official film you can get in touch with us by email at flamealivepod at gmail.com call or text us at 208-352-6348 that's 208 flame it our social handle is at flame alive pod and be sure to join the keep the flame alive podcast group on facebook Next week, we will be staying in the arts and entertainment category. We are talking with Julia Meinwald and Gordon Leary, creators of the new musical, The Magnificent Seven, which is based on the women's gymnastics tournament at Atlanta 1996. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive. <laughs> <laughs>